Welcome along to Baz and Andrew's House of Rugby together with Guinness and here on Joe. Uh, today we're looking ahead to Munster and Leinster in the Guinness Pro 14 semi-finals. Uh, later on, Barry Murphy's going to be chatting to Reese Marshall down in UL, uh, the Munster boys. Uh, I'm going to be chatting to John Fogarty today at Leinster and I'm here joined by Adam Byrne uh, who's looking ahead to the game with me as well. Joe presents Baz and Andrew's House of Rugby together with Guinness. We're here in the belly of the beast, as Barry Murphy often likes to say, um, in, in the, the heart of Leinster rugby. And, and we're sitting here with Adam Byrne today, uh, looking ahead to the Guinness Pro 14 semi-final between your Leinster and uh, well, Barry's Munster, let's say. Uh, how, how are things you were just showing me there before we kicked off the interview, your, your gnarly scar there that you have from your, your recent operation? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a long one, all right. But um, no, I'm just happy to have the operation done. And, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm on the road to recovery now. I started to rehab and started to load the quads. So it's feeling really good and hopefully no hiccups. And, you know, I can just ba get back to where I was. And we had, like, we often, you know, get people asking in or Twitter questions and stuff. And people asking about yourself and, you know, what's the time frame for yourself getting back? Is there, you know, like, um, is pre-season... Could yeah, you hit the I guess running? it's um, normally when you get a muscle reattached, it's anywhere between 12 and 16 weeks. So hopefully I'll aim for the lower half of that 12 weeks. But I, I guess the main thing is just making sure it's right. You know, I guess um, I don't want to push it and, you know, come back too soon and do it, make it worse. So uh, I'll aim for the lower half and I'll work as hard as I can to get back as quick as I can. But the main main focus is just get it back right. And did it happen in, was it a training accident or was it the Glasgow no, game? No, it actually playing? happened in the Glasgow game. So I'd had a, a dead leg um, for about a month before. I got a pretty big bang on that. So at the time, um, we were defending our line and, you know, when the forwards are picking and going, somehow I got caught up in there and um, kind of in a, a lunge position and just was trying to drive back their player. and. I thought I'd got hit in my leg, but uh, when I got up, I felt a little bit different. But I'd come on as a sub, so we didn't have any subs left. So I just thought it was a dead leg and thought mm -hmm. I'd manage it. But kind of as the last few minutes of the game went on, I realised it was something pretty bad. So unfortunately, um, the scan showed up. It was a pretty bad tear. So got it reattached and it's looking pretty good. So um, yeah, looking forward to just getting stuck into the rehab and getting back. And are you someone who, like, is there a medical term for it? Are you someone who would read up on this type of stuff? Or are you just kind of give me the time frame and uh, I'll get back? Uh, yeah, I, I, I probably would, uh, like, look into things. But um, I tried not to. I've known from the past, you know, Google and stuff definitely doesn't help. So um, <laughs> yes. once I got the scan, I just listened to the physios and the doctors and, um, you know, the surgeons to kind of key people who knew their stuff. And uh, the surgeon did tell me he had a few pictures of uh, when he, he operated inside my leg, but he hasn't sent them on yet. And I, I don't know if I want to see them, but uh, <laughs> no, I'm just happy it went well and, you know, it's done. Yeah, I once got a Jay Keenan, when he, the Con when he's a Connacht, sent me a picture of the inside of his hand because he had got a stud yeah. through it and it looked like somebody put a bike chain in there to try and keep the thing together like it was uh, yeah i don't know if i want to see it so i think <laughs> i'm happy to just look the scar and uh, let it heal yeah yeah and, and then for yourself you're saying that you have an exam coming up um what is it you're studying at the moment and yeah so uh, the lads are calling me van wilder i don't know if you've seen that movie <laughs> yeah. the guy who seems to forever be uh, in college but uh, i'm finishing off a master's in biomedical engineering oh, wow. so yeah, I have two more modules to do now next year and then um, then I'll have it done. So looking forward to that, the end is near. But uh, the one tomorrow, actually, funny enough, is in rehabilitation engineering. So I should <laughs> know, know my way around that one at this stage. So hopefully it goes well. And is there much time that you'd like spend with the students? Like, are you coming in then with the American football flinging around the back of the, <laughs> the back row of the class? Um, not really. I guess in the early stages when I was uh, in the academy, you know, we train maybe a little bit earlier. The time frames would be a little bit different. So I'd normally cycle in and then cycle over to lectures, uh, probably still sweaty and stuff. But uh, <laughs> no, at this stage, I, I kind of just try you know, look up on the work in my own time or go to the library when I get a chance or a week off or whatever. But um, yeah, I've, I've dropped down through the years because I'm doing a reduced workload. So I think I'm in my eighth year now uh, oh, wow. in UCD. So uh, there's a lot of new faces in there when I go in. But um, yeah, no, I, I, I'm able to manage it. And look, to be honest, I, I enjoy having another focus outside mm -hmm. of rugby and something to kind of uh, keep my brain taken over and focus on outside of rugby. So it's good. And particularly when you have an injury as well, it's another thing to, you know, kind of set goals for, aim for. So 
I enjoy it. And, and then you're you talking about cycling in. Would you kind of you still live in the area? Are you still like um, are you and are you living with any of the Leinster boys? Are yeah, you, yeah. Your own, the big um, bad world. So I live just about like a, a five minute. Uh, Five minute drive, ten minute cycle away in Klonski with Josh van der Fleer, Peter Dooley. Um, used to live with Tom Daly, he's obviously moved out west oh, yeah, to Connacht. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there's been the four of us. We have two other lads in there as well. And uh, yeah, it's been great fun. We used to live even slightly closer, but that house got sold, so we, we tried to stick together and we found another house. So yeah, we've had, we've had great fun. Um, you know, we did the, I think there was an Academy series that yes, yeah, uh, they yeah, filmed yeah. a while yeah. ago. You know, it's good crack in the house and it's just good to have everyone's support. And, you know, when someone's on an up or someone's on a low, at least we can kind of understand each other mm. and uh, kind of row in behind each other. So, no, it's good fun. And the other two lads in the house as well, it's great to have them there as well. One, one lad is an entrepreneur with his own business. The other guy is working in Deloitte and, you know, he played actually Ireland under 18s rugby with us as well. So he's, um, you know, it's good to have someone else that's not just rugby the whole time in the house. So, yeah, we enjoy it and we bounce off each other pretty well. That's good. And then, and so then you would have been close to get a, a close look at Van der Fleer and I was surprised enough myself yesterday when I heard yeah. that he was back, like some superhuman yeah, you know, feeds to get uh, back. Yeah, yeah he's, he's the ultimate pro and, you know, I guess it's, uh, it's great to be living with him as well just to see... You know, he's obviously very disciplined, the ultimate pro in here that everyone can see, but then at home as well, you know, his diet, his sleep, everything. So he's, um, you know, and to see him turn around, you know, a potential 12 week injury in seven or eight weeks is, mm. you know, I've been picking his brains and, you know, asking him, asking him questions the whole time. So he's, um, yeah, he's, he was calling himself back man because he was going to get himself <laughs> back in time. So. Uh, when he's injured, he always sets up phases for himself. So this one was back, man, and he uh, <laughs> he lived up to it. So he got back, I think, in seven or eight weeks. So um, you know, hopefully he'll get a run out this weekend, and I'm, I'm sure he'll uh, he'll do very well. Yeah, yeah. And, and does um, does that one there like about um, I suppose you guys all living together and talking about being an ultra professional as well. And, like, would it be handy then in terms of like cooking and you know you have your own meals and stuff like that then is anybody or do you kind of lean yeah, on one of the lads? I, I think we probably um because you know we're all kind of i'm in college and coming back we we normally do just cook separately mm. but i would definitely say the deft hand in the kitchen is peter dooley he, yeah. he knows his way around the kitchen and um, when he puts a bit of time into it he's very good and you know yesterday for example uh you know i was studying all day with the exams after after training and you know came back and he had the barbecue going and he'd gone to the shop got the meat and everything and uh it was a touch of class by him in fairness to come back and um i don't know who ended up cleaning cleaning up uh, yeah. i scoot it off to the library <laughs> but uh no sometimes like you know if it's a barbecue or something we'll all like um cook together but normally we just kind of do our own thing and and that and then you, you so like you're kind of grew up grew up in Kildare as well didn't you as well and um it's kind of kind of looking at the kind of the journey that you kind of had from there as well I was even reading up about you as well that um a, a lot of kind of guy on football there as well along the way is like and then rugby kind of late enough start for you wasn't it yeah so um yeah initially we grew up in dublin played soccer myself and my brother then moved to kildare and kind of i guess uh gaelic was probably uh the sport that i loved the most when mm. i was younger i loved that and you know my ultimate dream was just to play for the Lily Whites in Crow Park so everything was going towards that and then I kind of just came across rugby by chance I think it was just a friend saying you know you get a it was in school initially in ACBS and he just said you know you get Wednesday afternoons off so uh, <laughs> you know give it a go and um, yeah once I kind of started get, getting into rugby you know I found it uh, difficult to learn at the start but you know I loved it and kind of enjoyed the challenge as well and then things just kind of, I guess, went from there. Obviously, I had to give up the, the Gaelic soon after that. I had to make a decision, which was really tough at the time because it was around the time of minors. And, um, yeah, so it was really tough at the time. But, you know, I was still keeping touch with a few lads on the Kildare team. Like, I was only talking to, to Paddy Brophy, who played mm. AFL. Um, 
as well himself. So, yeah, I you know it's something I would love to have done, but uh, I'm definitely glad I stuck with the with the rugby. What what age did you keep going with? I mean, was the local was Kill the local team as well? Yeah, Kill yeah. was the local team. So you know we we weren't normally I'd say we probably don't do too well against you know the bigger towns like Nace or Selbridge, but for our age group we used to kind of punch above our weight. You know we had a really good group of lads like myself, and my brother were playing the team. There was. Um, Shane O'Hagan, Jack Healy, uh, just a few of the lads who were, you know, really good, all played Calaire underage. And then, yeah, I guess it was probably around 16 uh, or 17, where I was kind of, maybe I was a year young for the minor team, I was kind of maybe pushing for that. And then it was also a year young for the Leinster Youths team. So I guess, you know, at that age, you know, you'd have maybe older people saying, ah, oh, sure, you can easily play both when I was your age. You know, we'd, we'd go from a, you know, a rugby match to a soccer match to a Gaelic match in one day. But um, no, I, I wasn't able for that. I think I remember I had like Osgood Schlatters, I think it was called. It was like lumps on my knees from growing pains and oh, I wow. used to be in bits. So uh, I tried to keep it going as long as I could. But um, <clears throat> Unfortunately, had to one of them had to give, and uh, I chose to stick with the rugby. And I'm obviously uh, glad I've, I've done that, but I do miss the Gaelic. And what's it like when you go back? Would you, like, do you still get back to kill much? Go into the dew drop in for, for a drink <laughs> yeah. over Christmas or something? Yeah, yeah. I head back, um, and it, when I first moved up, I'd go back. You know, every chance I got, it was only like a, a half hour drive. And, you know, my mum would bring back a, a big bag of washing for her to do <laughs> yes. and, you know, get a few meals cooked for me, so it was nice. But, um, yeah, now it's a little bit, you know, the weekends are a little bit more busy, busier and trying to study up here, you know, a few other things going on. So I'd probably get home once every two weeks. And, yeah, you know, a couple of a couple of my mates, you know, are always hanging around and one of them actually works in the dew drop. So, oh, you know, he might throw me out an odd point or two <laughs> when, when I go back. But, uh, no, I really enjoy going back and even to catch up up with the lads one of my good mates works in Parmerstown House Golf Club and mm. you know try to go over and play a few holes with them and yeah it's always great to get back and you know try to keep in touch with the lads that I grew up with so I always my, enjoy it. Myself and my dad played that course a few years ago and I couldn't get to the 18 because I'd lost all the balls. Yeah, <laughs> There's so many lakes tough, and, yeah. and stuff around there. Yeah I don't think I think I've walked it a few times when I was younger but I don't think I'd be able to last now. Yeah. I'm always banking on uh, my friend to you know get the keys for a buggy so <laughs> Um, but yeah, I don't even think I've, I've played longer than 12 holes in the last in the last couple of years. But no, it's a good course. And, and at the weekend, then, like, so I, 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 did you get over to Newcastle at the weekend, or were you still like, a, a, were you part of the squad? You all flew over together, and yeah, so it was great that uh, you know Leinster brought you know the extended squad. Obviously, there was the the match day 23 in the reserves, but um, you know Leinster organised for everyone else you know, to kind of go over and there was a function beforehand and, um, you know, it was great to be there right beside the, the subs bench and just be able to cheer on the lads and um, and as well also to be there and kind of, I guess, share the emotion when, you know, we came up that little bit short. So, um, you know, really appreciative that Leinster were able to bring us over. And, and you've been in that position before, like, you know, like you've had a game, like after the game, because I was even... Like I was standing in the mix zone and you kind of, you have to chat to the lads, but you almost don't want to talk to them, you want to leave them be, but you have to, but is it the same for you? Are you kind of looking to kind of, do you leave the lads be or do you have the odd word every now and then or everybody's yeah. different? Yeah, I guess, I guess everyone's different. I guess at this stage we're, you know, we're really close friends, we nearly, you know, have that kind of family, brother relationship. So I guess you know everyone individually and, um, but I think, Maybe I just most mostly just leave the lads themselves, especially the lads who played. Um, but yeah, when I think back to maybe a couple of years ago when we lost to Scarlets and um, Claremont mm. and the season was over, you know, I think the one thing that stuck out was just being having to wait so long for your next game. You know, there was months you know in the summer before the next game so I think the great thing is you know it is extremely you know sore at the moment but at least you know we've we only have to wait a week before we can get back to our home stadium the RDS and you know get to play a great team like Munster so you know hopefully we can put in a really good performance and come out on the right side of the result and I'm sure the lads that's the best thing I think you want you know another game as soon as you can mm. just to show what you can do so. 
And then, um, I suppose at that game, I suppose, yeah, as you said, Munster of all the guys to get back up against. But from you, I suppose, just in that kind of position where you kind of cover the, the back three, um, I suppose Munster's threats, like, you know, if you think of the, you could have Haley, Earls, and Conway coming up against the, the lads, it'll be tough at the weekend, won't it? Yeah, um, you know, obviously, uh, would have been in camp, you know, a few times with um, Keith Earls and Andrew Conway, and, you know, they're exceptional really good wingers um you know i'm always probably picking earls these brains and stuff and asking questions uh you know reads the game very well and obviously an incredible player for ireland monster over over the years but um yeah we know the threats that they're going to bring mike haley as well has come in this mm. season done very well but also you know i'm sure the lads will back themselves whoever we have out in the back tree as well so um you know i'm looking forward to that contest and seeing the contest in the air as well i'm sure it'll be be a tough one, but um, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a tough one, but evenly matched. And then as the the last one for me is just kind of as you're saying, the focus now is on kind of getting yourself right and stuff like that. Um, hopefully, maybe if you get back in time, get into maybe like pre World Cup camps and stuff like that as well. But are you gonna give yourself a, a week or two off, even in the middle of it all, to, to get your head showered, get your head washed away from it all for a week or two at least? Yeah, yeah. So I had a holiday uh, booked to America um, before I got injured. So luckily enough, I've worked it out with the physios that I can still still go to America and then um, enjoy that and, uh, you know, have fun over there and then come back and it'll just be, you know, get, my, get myself right and get myself back as quick as possible. So, yeah, looking forward to both of them. Yeah, well, good luck and good luck over the summer. Good luck at the exam as well. Cheers. Yeah. Thanks very much. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Reese Marshall, you're 20,000 kilometres from your home just north at the New Plymouth in New Zealand, and you've just extended your stay at Munster till 2020 at least. Um, you've been described as an integral part of the Munster squad by a few people. Um, but before we get into that, I want to talk to you about your rugby life in New Zealand, where it started. Um, for us over here, we look at all New Zealanders and imagine that every kid, every teenager aspires to be an all-black. Was that the way it was for you? Uh, yeah, yeah. so growing up, uh, two older sisters, um, both played rugby. Um, rugby's kind of in the, in the genes. Granddad play it, played it, I played it. Dad and my brother and my granddad all played provincial level rugby, so it was always kind of, um, it was the four-year-old's dream to be an all-black, like you say, and um, growing up on the farm, we had the local club and I'd played um, played rugby, like I said, since I was four, um, and yeah, and so Dad was the coach, and it's just that's how, how it panned out. All the way up, he coached, followed your teams all the way up through? Uh, yeah, yeah. He, um, so he was actually coaching the seniors um, and, and a rival club, so our local club. Um, so he was coaching across the bridge pretty much, uh, where he was brought up and where he was raised. Um, so I played for a rival, like a rival club when I was little. And then from there, yeah, into just school stuff. Um, Dad was still coaching away and then seventh form, I, um, sorry, Last year of school, uh, I got into the well, got into the first fifteen. I got named as captain, so Dad threw in the old coaching gig just to kind of come and watch my games, uh, which was pretty cool. Um, he'd be coaching. He retired young enough. Um, they don't have shoulder surgeons like they used to, so he dislocated it twice, and they kind of said to him, "Oh, you can keep playing rugby. Or you can be a farmer." So he went farming. Farming was the route for him. Yeah, yeah. And uh, did you think farming would be the route for you, or did you I, have an eye on professional rugby? Yeah. So yet? after after school, things kind of didn't pan out. I wasn't kind of on a whole lot of radars or anything like this, um, as far as New Zealand schools or New Zealand academies or anything like that. So I was like, "Oh, my other love and life uh, farming." So I went over to the other side of the country. Um, just kind of went to the well, what, what worked out to be um, probably the best decision I made was I went working for two years and it kind of I was playing just under 20s rugby just for the local club and I was loving my code and being an 18 year old boy kind of thing and it was it was good we were working hard um, I was 88 ish kilos dripping wet so uh, riding a horse every day kind of in my element so I was on the farm every day, six o'clock in the morning job, yeah, yeah. all day, yeah. working, no food. Is that what you mean when you say you were yeah. 80 kgs? No, I, I would still eat, but you kind of, work was prioritised over food. So you kind of go out and you come back and you still got a lunchbox full of food. Mm -hmm. So like, 
you have that for dinner. Um, but no, that was that's just how it was for the first 12 months anyway. And then I got into the Hawke's Bay um, under-20s team and went went away and played alright and played well. And then New Zealand 20s the, for the following year got in touch and said they were interested in giving me a crack. So. What was that like? You went so you came. Back, I did. Have not gone through any academies. Yeah, or? yeah. I, I did the full circle. So I, um, so I hadn't been training. I hadn't been doing anything. I'd just been working on the farm. And so I um, got the. There was a gym on the farm, just with a whole lot of old kettlebells and stuff. So I, we lined those up and got them. Got all the uh, all the machines working again. Um, and so I had a good mate who did it with me. Um, so I went from one extreme to the other, from not training to training full time, um, eating and like I said, food was, wasn't prioritised but then um, I had to put weight on because I turned up to the first camp and the coach stood me up and he kind of said, well, how do you expect to make this team? And I took it really personally, like he's having a, this is in front of the whole, um, a whole squad. Right. And so I just kind of took it so personally, um, so I went away and became a bit of a fanatic um, so I was eating probably six or seven meals a day um, in the saddle, kind of on my horse. <laughs> and so I'd go to I'd go to bed um, full, and I'd wake up full. It was yeah. a nightmare. It was, uh, but we weren't we weren't paid a hell of a lot. So I um, so every every dollar I had went from going into booze and kind of into food and um, doing things right. So since then I haven't really been able to eat tuna. Um, it's not really. You were stuffing into yourself. I just so literally three of those a day, yeah. um, fingers Tins and all, tuna. tin tuna, yeah. just and, um, but no, that was me. Um, and so I actually, so I'd work all day, go to training, come back and go to the gym because that was the only time I could have time. So I was burning the candle at both ends, and that kind of I learned a pretty tough lesson about a couple of weeks out from the first trial. Uh, I got diagnosed with blood poisoning and. Um, kind of, I was just run down, and so I got septicemia. Jesus. Um, yeah, so I had exhaustion, um, so everything kind of went into a, into shutdown, uh, which was a bit scary. Wow. So that was, yeah, so that was two weeks in hospital, and I came out and I was 86 kilos, and I just remember I was the most upset I'd been ever. Undone all the work Undone that you, everything. Everything you put in. And so that, that, that got me, and so then I went along to the 20s trials, and not being involved in the first trial because I just got out of hospital was kind of a, a kick in the teeth. Um, they wouldn't let me do much. And so that, that was fine. Um, and so the next trial, I was gearing up for it. I was back into the mode, um, kind of learned a lesson. And then I get a phone call. It's, uh, Reese, where are you? Um, the trials are kind of, everything's underway. I was thinking, oh, sh so I hopped in my uh, 92 Ford Mondeo and... Oh, I'm disappointed you didn't have the horse. But I, nah, <laughs> I, but you, I, I, you riding I, had, horse. I turned up and I had my <clears throat> knife belt on. I'd been killing sheep all day. <laughs> I had my knife belt on, had my swan dry on and I was covered in blood. And I had my rucksack because that's all I had. I literally ran into my room and I had an old army rucksack and I literally filled it up, flew to this and I flew. And I got there and I heard, a, I hopped out of the car and I heard a hissing and I was like, ah, oh, that'll be fine. So I shot in anyway, it was a four day trial. I'd missed the first two days. So they had a two day scrum session and with um, Chrono. And it was, that was, that pissed me off. So now I'm in there, I'm pissed off. And so I trained unbelievably well. I played incredibly well for me anyway, I was, cause I was so angry that no one had thought to give me a call a couple of hours into the session. They decided to call me after yeah, the, it. yeah, yeah. So, but that's, that's what happens when you're not in the mix, you're not in the, and the, in in the, the circle, loop. yeah. So yeah. you weren't and in the loop even with other players, basically? And, no, well, I didn't know anyone. Okay. I kind of met a few guys through Hurricane Schools and stuff at the trials, but I didn't know anyone. They weren't your mates? No, nah, well, I, I kind of, of walked in there and I was kind of a, no one knew who I was, mm. and I didn't really know any of them. And so, yeah, so that was, that was the second trial, and I actually went really, really well. And then the final trial, um, the, the number one hooker didn't turn up with a broken foot. So here's a, days. yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, um, I still remember getting my name, getting called out and it just couldn't believe it, couldn't believe it. Really? And so, yeah. And so that was basically, uh, my twenties run, um, kind of from not having any, um, gym experience or anything. And my gym technique still gets hounded because I'm, I'm horrendous. Yeah. I just kind of, I, oh, I give it a go kind of thing. Yeah. And, um, that's inspiring to think, you know, that even like, 
if you were to if you were a father and you had a young lad, you'd almost want him to go through a, a that. Well, I would anyway. Want him to go yeah. through that more route rather than the usual academy. Things are kind of handed yeah. to you a little bit. Um, I know that's not the case for all players, but for a, for a young man to go in and learn the discipline at 18 years of age of getting out on of a farm, getting out of bed at yeah, 5 o'clock yeah. in the morning and have to work. And not turning up hungover <coughs> on a Monday or... Yeah, and still having to, to do your day work and train yeah. and play and still have to do everything that everyone else does. Yeah, um, yeah that must have been something, there must be still something that you draw on. Yeah, I, 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 it was an unbelievable time um, for me, like you say, you learn a lot of life lessons pretty quick. Um, one of them was we burnt a, we're out the back, um, we were lambing ewes and the actual, the hut burnt while well, we half burnt the hut down. And so instead of kind of, yeah, no one to, we couldn't get in touch with anyone back and we're a probably two hours ride from anywhere. So one of the boys stayed back and fixed the hut while we had to pick up his work because we all had jobs to do. Mm. And so we literally, there was no complaining, there was no, oh, you left the candle too close to the ceiling kind of thing and it's your fault. It was, listen, I'll stay back here, I'll fix everything up. You guys just take my workload. So we went out and did his jobs for him and he stayed at home, fixed the, fixed the place up, sorted dinner kind of thing. Mm. And it was those things. But then it's also, it, it was cleaning the toilets. It was yeah. um, killing sheep and getting rid of the ends and using all of them. We Nothing was wasted on the farm mm. because we, had, we would have had probably 40 or 50 dogs. We would have had 20 or 30 horses, all that rely on kind of all the sheep and everything but yeah these dogs you had to feed them every night and they they are your best mates because you rely on them day in day out and some yeah. of them run their paws off you come back from work and and like you say to learn those life lessons the fact that guys around you kind of have your back when you need like I had I had horrible days where I'd, I just made absolute errors and it, 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 it makes me laugh. Like I had absolute fuck ups, really. <laughs> and um, and so then all the sheep go in the wrong direction, and you can't sit there and sit on your laurels. You're on your horse, and you're gone. Yeah. There's no thought about it. There's no. Oh, Shit. it's your fault. Right. It's your. Yeah. And then I was coming across the valley, and I saw my mate coming down the other side, full noise on his horse because he saw. So they broke down, and if they got if they got away, they would have been gone. Yeah. And so that would have just been a nightmare. And. But without talking to him, without yelling at him, without anything, he was on his bike. And I love the fact that you can compare that to a team like that I'm playing with now, or I've played with in the past. Yeah. Guys are kind of, when the chips are down, you see he turns up. Yeah. And so that's what I kind of, especially walking into a super rugby team like the Chiefs, you, you, you're surrounded by blokes like Liam Messam and Cruden and Sam Kane and all these kind of blokes. And you were brought in there at 20 years of age, right? Yeah, yeah, and it's these Craig Clarks and all these blokes who kind of, they're not superheroes, they're not any different to anyone else, and you're Richard McCaws and things. They're just normal blokes, but they're willing to kind of do extraordinary things. Yeah. So that was kind of, that was my biggest taking, especially from going through that route, is they're just normal blokes, um, and a lot of people just spend a lot of time idolising and, and making them so important that they can't do any wrong but mm. nine times out of ten they are just um, even the big scary ones like Brody Italic are just just yeah. lads and they made you very welcome down with the, yeah, with the Chiefs yeah, yeah so talk to us about the Chiefs then how did that how did that pan out for you uh, yes yeah, so I I rolled into and this is probably the big letdown of not doing the academy and stuff I rolled into that with the idea that I'd just keep playing kind of keep playing rugby mm -hmm. And I, I loved it, I really enjoyed it, and I loved doing, uh, playing a game for a living. Um, and so I got an opportunity to do it. And so I, I took it by ball by two horns and kind of had it a phenomenal first year. And played my first game, and both the hookers were out, and I played 80 minutes, and I loved every minute of it. And then um, one thing I wasn't used to was kind of the, the training schedules and the. And so I'd. I'd go out for a few beers kind of thing as I'd do on the farm on a Saturday night after the game and then Sunday there'd be another couple of beers so I'd go another couple of beers and you soon learn in a professional environment that you can't be you can't be doing that every weekend and mm -hmm. so I found out that out the hard way um, and so kind of um, I took a, a lot of learnings from that first year um, and then especially in my second year my throwing fell to bits and so I didn't know how to deal with that I didn't know how um, how I could turn that around. So all I did was I dove in. I did more and more and more reps. Um, 
being that the more I do, the better I get. Yeah. And I never knew anything different, and that's kind of how <clears> I've got through everything. And so I literally dove into it and was doing shit, two and a half, three thousand 3,000 throws a week. And it was, again, it was, I thought that I was getting better, but all I was doing was digging myself a massive hole. Yeah. Um, and so that didn't help with my rugby. And so then I started seeing everything in a different light, my attack, my defence, everything. And so all I was doing was doing extra, doing more, doing more, doing more. And so I wasn't kind of prepped enough to go, oh, I need a bit of help. So I had no idea what I was doing with my throwing. I had no idea what I was doing with my tackling. I was just like, if I do more, I'll get better. And I actually taught myself really bad habits. Bad habits yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that takes a little while to get rid of, and they're still not gone. Um, and no different to the gym. I just do more gym, so I wouldn't tell the trainer. I'd just go off and do extra gym, or I'd go do extra running. Or, and then when you start getting injuries and niggles, they're like, well, where's this coming from? And the fact you haven't told them you'd played, gone and played touch or tag on a Wednesday mm. kind of thing and thought nothing of it because... Um, you thought you're doing extra. This while you're playing Super 14. Yeah, rugby. yeah. Or going, you go rowing. I'd, I'd go down and just hop on the row, and I'd turn out my back would be lynched. And they're like, "What's going on here?" I'm like, oh, "I'm not sure." It's, yeah. But it's because I was worried that um, because I was worried that if I didn't do enough, I'd be kind of mm. left behind or forgotten. And is that about. how did it, how did it, how it came to an end? Then did you? Uh, yeah, do yourself I, out of a contract with that? Yeah, yeah. So my throwing was one thing that kind of really let me down. And so I went away and got a coach, um, got a psychologist, got a few people on board because it's amazing how it's actually the support network that mm -hmm. keeps you kind of afloat when everything hits the wall. And so I got through that and had two phenomenal uh, ITM Cup seasons uh, as far as my throwing went. Um, that was probably one of my proudest moments. And the Chiefs turn around and go, oh, listen, you know, we've got this young fella coming through. Um, we want to give him a contract. Would you mind taking a wider, wider training? And I said, shit, not at all, no, no bother. So when I did that, and then they came back to me and said, I oh, actually, listen, it's going to be an injury cover. Um, so still in, still in for the time, um, So I was, but I wouldn't have been part of the squad, as say. So after a few years up there, that kind of bit me. Hmm. And then my province came back and said, I oh, actually, we're going to offer you this amount. And not, not to say that I play rugby for the money. I don't at all. I do it because I love it. And, but for your home province to come and do that, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a kick in the head. Hmm. And I, I know it's not a it's not a financial game, but it's as you'd understand, it's where you grow up. It's kind of, mm -hmm. and so then I thought, bugger it, I'm just going to take it. Um, and if the injury cover is for three weeks, it's for three weeks. And then I'll just go back on the farm and work on the farm and play for Taranaki, and that was my plan. Um, and then Russi, uh, Russi Rasmus called me, and so I had I had a conversation with um, Montpellier and one other club over there and a, um, a couple of clubs around the place. And I was like, oh, I'm not really that interested. Um, don't really think, don't really know much about them. Don't really know um, a lot about European rugby. Um, and then, yeah, Russi called me and I had no idea where he was coaching and I had no idea who he was. <laughs> I, I, knew, I knew who he was, but mm. I didn't, didn't realise he was in a coaching role. Mm. And he said, I'm at Munster Rugby. And I kind of sat there and he said, oh, we're interested in signing you. And I was thinking, shit, like this is, must be an injury cover thing. And he's like, no, we're interested to get the RFU on board as well and bring you over as um, kind of going forward would be interested in you. And I was thinking, where's this come from? Like, where has he seen me play? Like, um, but then, yeah, so that was about the time my granddad uh, became quite ill and he was always a Munster man. Um, Ever since um, the, ever since Munster gave the All Blacks a hiding, it's always been a legend at home. Anyway, so, really, I was yeah. going to ask you that. I was like, what? The, what are the thoughts of yeah, Munster yeah. back home? Yeah. And... Um, so my family being absolute rugby heads. Yeah. Um, so that still stings. Still stings. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> it, it, it takes a bit of settling. Um, yeah. yeah. So, but no, Granddad. Um, so he was he was on board with the fact that I was staying in Taranaki and. And he was happy I was on the farm. But then I went and told him that. Because I told him that there'd been other offers and he was kind of like, oh. I went and told him that and he said, you can't not do it. Okay. So I was like, Shh. well, I suppose if Granddad says I have to do it, I kind of have to yeah, do it. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. That's a serious seal of approval. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially for me. Um, back in the day, he played professional rugby before it was professional rugby. Yeah. So he was working full time and kind of... His old fellow was on the farm, no time for no time for sport when you're on the farm kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So granddad would travel a mile to get to play footy kind of thing, to play rugby. 
And then he played five caps for Taranaki and he never looked back. He loved every minute of it. And so for me to get his seal of approval was just like, yeah. Brilliant. Gone. Okay, so you packed your bags. Yeah. That was yeah. It. Uh, granddad passed away about three weeks later. Oh, man, I'm yeah. sorry. Ah. Jesus. But not, Dad and I get up, a couple of whiskeys in the airport for him and on wow. the plane. So. Amazing. And then I flew, on, flew in on the Monday, played on the Friday against Ospreys. And then the following week played the Mouldy All Blacks and came <laughs> off the bench. Wow. So, yeah, so we got down to Cork, full house in Cork, and that was crazy to yeah. get down there and experience that. Because um, in New Zealand there's no singing, there's no nothing. Mm. And to get down there and experience that, you turn around, you got the Mouldy All Blacks coming the next week. Wow. Um, I was kind of in awe for a long time, so. Yeah, I think that was perfect timing when <laughs> yeah, you, got but, to, yeah. you got to see and, uh, Limerick. And, and, and growing up here, we were always obsessed with the All Blacks yeah. from like as a kid. For me, it was always, yeah, 1978 obviously was probably the reason for that. But, yeah. but because New Zealand rugby was, you know, the, the level was so much above everyone else in the world. And uh, then the history of players coming here to play as well from New Zealand. Yeah. Um, Ian Jones, do you remember yeah. Ian Jones? Did yeah. you know he played for? No. He came here and played for? He's, Did he? He's in, probably the only other Chiefs player, yeah, I yeah. think. Would he? Probably, yeah. Yeah, he played yeah. for Old Crescent in Limerick oh, yeah. for a year. In 1992, yeah. he was an All Black. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he, he decided to come over, take a year out, came over and played for, for Old Crescent across yeah. town. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember going meeting him uh, on Saturday morning. And my dad was like, do you want to go meet Ian Jones? And I was like, I was only 10. I was yeah. like, absolutely. I went over and he was enormous. Yeah, like, yeah. saw him a rugby ball and stuff. But yeah. yeah, he came here and played for a year and then went back and played for the All Blacks for the, for the following World Cup. And Those were the good old days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Incredible, yeah, man, yeah. where you could do that. Yeah. I remember hearing a story where he came here. He was then on holidays the following year after playing a season with the All Blacks. And he stopped in Limerick for a few days and his club, Crescent, were playing a thirds. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Quarter final. Yeah. And they asked him to jump on the bench to play just in case they needed him. And he was like, Yeah, sure. I love this. Like, so casual back then, you could jump yeah. on the bench. So he jumps on the bench, and uh, they were winning at half time. They're playing against Tormund, Keith Earls' old club. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they brought him on at half time. And the Tormund boys upped the game so much because he came on that yeah. they beat the shit out of them. Pummeled them, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they were all taking his autograph after the game, like all the other players. Yeah. Um, so there's, and then you'd Reese Ellison, Maffs, Doug Howlett, Rua Tapoki, obviously Tyler and uh, Christian Cullen. Christian Cullen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like that to come, like you look at the kind of the, the and then the Francis Sileys, like you say, yeah. the Tyler Blindells, the Albie Mathewsons, the Kiwis who kind of come over here are all, and then. Coming over, I was thinking about it. I was like, ah, oh, shit, I hope there's not too much pressure on me, kind of thing. Yeah. I was like, I hope they're not expecting me to turn up and be this phenomenal Dougie Howley kind yeah, of yeah, <laughs> finisher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like, oh. um, but I'll, no, I was, me and my old man laughed about it. He's like, well, they haven't signed a Dougie Howley, that's for sure. And I was like, yeah, well, that's, yeah. that's fair. Probably the first hooker we've signed as well. Yeah, isn't it? yeah, yeah, I'd yeah. say so, yeah. So, yeah. But so no, yeah, that's some entrance, man. And I suppose then, uh, when you say you'd had so much trouble with your throwing and stuff, how's it been working with Fla? For the last couple of years, class. Has it? Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. So I kind of got my end of the old mental side of it sorted, and mm -hmm. that was probably half the battle, like they say. And kind of got got my idea of what I needed to do, and then you like I said you get alongside the guy, a guy like Fla, mm -hmm. and and he's just always there to catch a ball, and he's always there for a little a little pointer. He won't change everything you're doing at all. So that for me is perfect. Mm -hmm. I didn't need a guy coming in and teaching me how to throw again, and he wasn't, so. But he's currently doing a little bicep session over there at the moment. That's for you, so yeah. yeah, he's so prepping, he he's yeah. prepping before yeah. he gets in here. We're here in the Monster Gym and Keith Earls and Flower. <laughs> Keith Earls just said he can't believe that Reeves had a saddle for his horse, because he no. wouldn't see that in my ass. No, um, and he had a bit, bit of passion in the occasional roundabout. Yeah. Uh, have you ever gone out riding horses with him? No, no. no. I heard Donica um, Ryan's dad's been looking after you a little bit, is he? Yeah, yeah. So I've been up to Nina a few bit, um, just doing farm discussion groups and stuff. So uh, yeah. that, I've, we've had some hilarious days out there in class. Really? Just um, kind of seeing the contrast between New Zealand farmers and Irish farmers. Yeah. The everything that's different, but everything that's exactly the same. Yeah. Um, so that that that's what I enjoy. So my missus is a vet. Um, 
and so we're kind of in that circle anyway. Mm. So um, yeah, I love getting out and just getting amongst them, seeing what they're up to. Cool. Um, so currently doing a soils paper, so going just dirt paper really uh, for university. So I'm going around collecting um, samples and stuff, and they're just hilarious. Like you go in there and you have to meet grandma and granddad, and you have to stay for a cuppa, and mm. then it's 11:30, and you're thinking, "Sheep, is these Train three people going to go to bed?" <laughs> And I'm sitting there and it's my th third slice of cake and yeah. fourth cup of tea and I'm just like, oh, guys, it's been awesome. Like, yeah. and, but they leave with your bags of dirt. But literally, they, they don't know that I play rugby and I, I don't emphasise that, but I'm just, again, a Kiwi in, yeah. kinda in Limerick in an island. And so, yeah, so I go out there and I'm digging holes and they see the flashlight come up one morning and they're like, who's that? I'm like, it's oh, it's I have to get another sample. I call the head. <laughs> and they're like, get off my life. I was like, listen. I'm... Um, but not no, wearing any shoes. Not, wear, not wearing like any shoes. Yeah. not wearing yeah. any shoes. Yeah. They're out of like a typical Kiwi. Yeah. Yeah, we had every Kiwi, I reckon, that came to Limerick for, uh, for the 80s and 90s ended up on our yeah. sitting room floor, man, or yeah. our couch for some reason. My dad just had an obsession with it, so we would always have them. Uh, and it was the best way to grow up, man. It's, it's amazing. Because there's so much similarities, right, between yeah, the two So much. Cultures. And the fact that there's four million people, kind of, I think that's that's half of it. Like yeah. I know um, a lot of Irishmen, they're, they're very, 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 like, they're, they're good. They're good to open the door and have a pint with you. Mm. Um, and But they're also good if you just need a yarn or if you just want a cup of tea. Mm. And that's no different to at home. Um, so I've met a lot of people here who are more than willing to help me out or, and they wouldn't even bat an eyelid and nine times out of ten they don't know that I play for Munster mm. and whether that's, so uh, I went out um, and got a couple of things engraved a couple of weeks ago, just a couple of little toys for um, the boys that are having babies and your man's just like, so we're sitting there, I was sitting there for about four hours just chewing the fat with him and kind of he gave me a couple of these massive plaques of wood and they're beautiful um, bog wood all done up so yeah. I do a lot of shooting so I've got a lot of stag heads and stuff and so these are 150 200 bucks worth of wood like there's so much because I used to do them I know how much work has to go into them and he's like man just keep them so I called him up on the weekend I was like hey um any chance you're looking for a couple of rugby tickets rugby tickets for what <laughs> I'm like well the quarterfinals on so he, so he, he lives in Ennis and he's a GAA to the to the guys. Right. What? What do you mean? Ah, uh, fuck! No, no, no. Well, <laughs> no you'll be idea. fine. You had no idea. Not a, not an inkling of a clue. Yeah, that's brilliant. And then I drove. I went out there. Um, I was I was shot out there the other day, and I was just like, you know, pulled up in a Munster car. He's like, what are you doing in that? I'm like, oh, I'm playing with him. He's like, oh yeah. <laughs> and kind of didn't make anything yeah. of it. Um, but no, that, that's Classic. what I. Yeah, yeah. That, but that's what I love about it. And it was just hilarious. Yeah, what quarterfinal? I was like, oh, jeepers. He's 30 minutes up the road. And every time I go out there, he's so thankful. Thanks for coming out. Like, thanks for coming. Yeah. And it's like, man, it's only half an hour. But yeah. Ireland's hilarious because it's so small. Yeah. Not used to kind of driving the. It's true. Yeah, we think it's a. We think it's an hour to do. Oh, an hour and a half the distance. It's a big job. Yeah. Um, and me and the missus are talking about it. We used to drive two and a half hours just to kind of shoot home for the night right. and that was oh. not you'd never think about it now I'm thinking about it going home in June going home to winter it's like oh we have to drive from here to here and I'm like oh it's a, <laughs> it's a long way <laughs> <laughs> we're stopping off on the way kind okay. of thing well it's safe to say so you're happy enough in Ireland and, yeah uh, would you have your sights on potentially playing uh, international rugby is that something you <sighs> yeah that's goal? Um, yeah I don't know I, I came over here and everyone was talking about it then and people have, haven't stopped talking about it and I don't know, for me, um, one step at a time. Yeah. And now it's coming up real quick and the missus is the same. She's like, well, we've got to make a bloody plan. I'm like, yeah, but I'd much rather just win months or something. Absolutely. And kind of tick this year off and then kind There's of no point be done it. with it. Yeah, yeah be done yeah. with it, go home. Um, to get and home then, for a month. And, yeah, get yeah. home for a month and then I'll be, by the time I get back over here and pre-season's done, everyone will be in World Cup mode. So mm. I will be, no one will be none the wiser. Mm. So, and then after that, um, yeah, I suppose I have to. I suppose I have to make a bloody decision. Yeah. Decision, I suppose. And before, I suppose you head home. And before you to make those decisions, you still have to finish out the season here. Exactly. And uh, no better way to do it than a semi-final against Leinster in the RDS. Exactly like last year. Mm. One point. Yeah. One measly point. It can be the biggest and the smallest margins. They yeah. just. But we saw on the weekend. Um, we were talking about it before. I just about had a heart attack in those last five or six minutes. Yeah. And you got Benetton who had playing unbelievably well and the boys who were just a pace, couple of, couple of percent off the pace yeah. and they were made look silly. Mm. 
and I was sitting there and I was like thinking if that drop goal goes off I'd be the angriest person because I couldn't help. I was sitting there on the sideline and that's the worst feeling in the world is you can't go in there and give your mates a hand. Yeah. You're sitting there and you're just like, oh, but RDS, Leinster, bring it on. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. It's, I've had the opportunity to play them a few times now and it's... Yeah, after what happened at Christmas, I think there was yeah. a lot of... <laughs> a lot of, uh, a lot of lot passion of, o- over spilling there, yeah, so you might have yeah. a little bit more of that. Yeah, I was red raw, yeah. just throat was gone. Again, I wasn't in the mix, so I was out the back and I was just into them. Yeah. And yeah, and it's hilarious. You play James Lowe and you play um, Jamison, like good mates of mine, but yeah. like all due respect, like they just, when they put that blue jersey on, they just, yeah, it's something about them. them. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Um, but no, that's that's kind of why you play it. You do it. You you play the game to get these derbies. Yeah. And Leinster are a phenomenal side. And as as we saw on the weekend, we can be a we can be an average side yeah. against the Benetton team who are playing very well. But everyone has their days. And I'm just really looking forward to hopefully being in the mix this weekend mm. um, and just climbing into them because it's going to be yeah, there's going to be no love lost anyway. Absolutely. Well, we're lucky to have you in the in the side, man. Yeah. So thanks so much for talking to us. Beautiful. Brace Marshall. We're here with John Fogarty, uh, fresh off the pitch um, at Leinster. And I was actually saying I was surprised. I, I haven't been at the game at the weekend over at St. James's Park. I just thought you boys would just take until Friday off and just kind of get back down. But you were saying you were in reviewing the game already on, on Monday then as well. Yeah, yeah. That sometimes you don't want to, you, you want to stay in, stay in the house and hide. But yeah. I think the best way to get over things is to, to deal with what's in front of you and, and that's what we did on Monday um, yesterday so yeah we, we came in and we met as a group of coaches and discussed everything from selection to um, game day management and so on and, and then we talked uh, then we met with the players and w- reviewed the game and yeah, it's, it's difficult because it's so close and mm. um, you were there so yeah. you know the, the emotion of, of it all like the support we had was just immense so for us to have that much just um, support, it should shock us all. I think when we're over there. Yeah, and, it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, and we, we're we're gutted, you know, for lots of reasons, but a lot of it is to do with you know we, we had so much support. <laughs> yeah, it was like because I was said like we do do the show with like Barry, who's Munster, and Andrew Trimble, who's Ulster, and we call Leinster the Lannisters as well, and they have everything going <laughs> for them. So that, they weren't too disappointed. They were even talking about wearing Saracens gear on the show when they did it on Sunday. They were, were they? Yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> I nice lads. I just told them I couldn't get the. Uh, I, 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 there was nothing on sale. I couldn't get it. I couldn't get my hands on it. Good, 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 good. But uh, but yeah, just from being there, like you know, even they were kind of just saying, it, it's like it's clear to them that like the two best sides in in Europe as well, and like it's. I was even I was talking to Jack Conan after the game, and I was saying it's hard to kind of say to a player, but it was like it's, it must be exciting in a way because. You'll, you'll surely meet this side again, like, you know, it's, if you guys both, you know, keep the foot mm. on the floor next season, there could be another collision that we could all look forward to at least next We would hope so, we would hope mm. so. I mean, that's, that would be our plan to be able to have days like that at the end of the season. And, you know, we'll, we, you know, I won't be there, but, but yeah, next year yeah. they'll, they'll plan that way and, and try and create something good in, in, this, in the season and get ourselves in another final. Um, that's, that's why Monday was so important, because the learnings you take from, from this kind of a game and not just the guys that played, but the entire squad. You know, things change. There's players in and out every season, and we get these new players popping up. So, um, the learning from that game is huge for us. You know, in the small moments that we didn't quite get it, why didn't we? Why didn't we? And mm. what can we do better? And, and that's what this week is about, really. And um, but really quickly, because we've got a we got a front up now against Munster yeah. on Saturday, which is which is pretty exciting to be honest. That's what I was saying. I was trying to talk to one of the lads in the office earlier. I was saying like, what happens when like when you've just you know, you're Spider-Man and you've taken on the Green Goblin or something like that, like I said, and you Sandman or something like that is waiting for you up the road or like, you know, it's, there's another kind of thing to, to get you kind of Fight, like, scrap, yeah, yeah. another yeah. big scrap, yeah, and you know, Munster will kind of, they might see that you guys are wounded as well, like, and we have to kind of, you know, press the knife in here as yeah, well. Yeah, like, there's no doubt that they're going to they're gonna try and take advantage of, of anything they can and, you know, we'd be the same, I suppose, you know, that's the nature of it. It's, mm. it's pretty cruel, you know, the, the sport is, it's, uh, you got to move on. Uh, the good thing about it with the with the lads is that you know uh, that's been the nature of it for the last couple of seasons. We've had to have finals or semi-finals. We lose semi-finals. We've got to go into a pro mm. pro fourteen semi-final and try and get through that. And uh, that's been the nature of it for the last number of years. So they're getting better and better at digesting what happens at the weekend, whether you win big or 
or in the, in the last weekend's case, we lose big, you know, digesting it all. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, they're, they're getting there, yes, slowly but surely. And, and f- like from, uh, I think I was in row B, so I was pretty close to the action, but like, it's just, it was absolutely like, you know, a brutal game of rugby and, and like so, so many of them are when you get to the, the, the highest level as well. But as a coach, what are you thinking when you're looking at some of this stuff? Like, you know, it's like, it's like a red wall that you're up against as well and kind of... Yeah, like, so we, we all have our areas that we coach and mm. so for me, I'm looking, when we're carrying into that red wall, I'm looking at carry type and how our, what, are, what we're doing at the rock and... So we're looking at our bits, and you're, we're very much switched on. Um, in that last ten, you, you, oh jeez, we're it's twenty ten. We have ten minutes left, mm. and that's probably their most dominant part of the game, when they're ahead and they just stop on us, and, and they, they're keeping us in our own half. And you know, we eventually get turned over. Yeah. At that stage, you're just like, we're dust here. You know, we're, we're mm. done. Um, but for huge portions of that game, for sixty minutes as a coach, even you know, even the little things that happen in either side of half time. You're still kind of feeling quite good about how the team is is moving through the game. So mm. that first 60 minutes, we're going quite well. There's 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 there's, a, there's opportunities that the lads wanted to take either side of half time, uh, didn't happen. And then there was some calls that didn't quite happen. Um, and then, yeah. But as a, I think as a coaches, we 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 still felt it was 10 all. You know, yeah. we need to get ourselves in a nice position and let's smash this red wall down. Yeah, and, uh, we, there's belief that we can, and mm. uh, it, it didn't happen. But mm. uh, small things, small things. There was, uh, like, I suppose, that, let's go back then, or let's, even from, from your own time here at Leinster as well, of like maybe a slightly brighter kind of memory for yourself or something to look back on. I remember chatting to Emmett Farrell here a few years ago. Um, he was talking about doing the video analysis and when a move kind of comes off in a game or when a set play comes off, and he was talking about a line-out move they did against Biarritz. Uh, where they split the middle of them, and I think Jamie Heaslip carried through the middle okay, of the line yeah, yeah, yeah. and he was saying that's something they had spotted, that they drifted. Yeah, right. Is there a moment like that, as a, like you know, in, in your job, where you kind of is there something that you spotted and it works? Is there ever is there anything that comes ah, there to is. mind? We, if we catch like saying in the scrum, if we've a, a certain plan and <laughs> yeah. we want to catch someone out, we get it done. Um, there's always that little yeah yeah. But uh, yeah, and uh, it, the same with line out if. if at the very start of the game, you know, Leo, Leo scouted quite well, and we we caught them, and they, mm. they, they were penalised the very very start of the game. Yeah. they're they're nice moments, but um, yeah, there's so much more to it. I've, Emmett's a very selfish kind of person. So he's always <laughs> yeah. he's always thinking of himself. So for, we're more thinking of the lads than, than ourselves. I think when we're when we're, when we're out there coaching. I was going to think, yeah, like if there is something that worked, it like who do you turn to? Who's the other person in the room or the coach's box <laughs> that knows that you were the one who did that? Like or, Leo, I probably wanted want to go. That was great, but if I did that, he'd probably you'll shut up. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. But, um, um, I think actually, I was, you were uh, you were on the sideline, weren't you? Uh, to, like yeah. you were, you're the one who's on to Leo there because I think I saw that in the first yeah, half. Yeah, yeah. So he's the one every now and then he'll just kind of. Are you his voice then on down on exactly. the pitch sometimes? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So I message forwards, um, and sometimes not a whole lot to say. You know, sometimes mm. you go out with a message and they already have it. Yeah. You know, they could just be like, "Yeah, we know. We got yeah. it. We got it." Um, other times they need a little bit of energy, or um, but a lot of the time it's just. Um, more confirming what's already happening out there, and you're, you know, but Lee, that's it. Leo will message me, I message it forwards. Uh, Charlie will message back through, through Stuart. Mm. Um, so, that's how it runs. And, and then, like with your own kind of, you know, journey, and uh, you're moving on to Ireland then after World Cup as well. But could you ever have seen that coming? You know, you had to retire, kind of like concussion related as well. Like, could, could you ever look back to that moment where you finished up and? Was there ever a moment you thought you might be actually finished with rugby? You might have to move on to something else. I, I did. I didn't. Um, so I, I always wanted to stay involved in rugby. Um, so I was I, I was coaching all the way along. So as a player, as a as a player when I was in Galway in Connacht, I was coaching under 16s and under 18s yeah. just to coach. Mm. Um, and then when I came to Dublin, um, I wanted to get involved in coaching, and I coached J1s out in Dallas South Parmesan, and then coached some of the senior side for a while, and then went on to coach. With Belbo, so I was always I always wanted to be involved in coaching. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd finished a business uh, sports management course in in Waterford when I was there, and then when I came to Dublin, I did a sports management a masters, and again I, I wanted to again stay involved in some way. Um, and it was just about perfect the timing of it um, to get involved with the academy, uh, developing young players. Yeah. Um, as a EPDO was awesome, so that that was just perfect. Um, but there was, there was a few months where I was sick of rugby and I was depressed thinking of myself mm. and thinking, oh, I should be still playing and all that stuff. But that, that goes away quite quickly. And then you're kind of going, oh, quite lucky to actually have done that. Yeah. Uh, move on now. And uh, um, I was lucky to get involved with Leinster in the academy side up, set up. And it's sort of gone from there. 
Um, I was desperate. I remember thinking after I'd finished, um, I, I really wanted to get back to into the middle of the RDS. Um, yeah. And I didn't know. I didn't know quite know how. Uh, Leo the like, line or something. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Dress me up. Yeah. But I was. I was, I, was, I was kind of, how can I get back involved with this? Mm. And then once, once I started to get back involved with Leinster, instantly you're thinking, how can I, is there any way I can get back involved in Ireland? And so the, well, I'm not going to say there was a perfect plan put yeah, in place, yeah. but in my mind, I always wanted to get back um, to the professional setup and you know, be involved in, at some level. And mm. it started off with, with development and it ended up with the coaching thing. So hopefully I can, yeah. hopefully I can drag this out for another few years. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I often talk about that in my career as well. Like, <laughs> exactly. Still doing it, still getting away. Yeah. Somebody's paying me. Um, there is a thing as well where, like as you said, like starting off with the academy, is there a player or two that you've almost had the journey with that started around the same quite time? Quite a few, yeah. yeah quite a few, yeah. yeah. So the Byrne brothers, are, yeah, I was there. Yeah. Jack Conan's there. Um, Tyg Furlong, he was he was in the academy when I arrived there. So um, we've probably knocked about with each other, all those players. Yeah, um, yeah. I would have seen Ross Maloney when he was you know, 16, 17. Uh, James Ryan, all, 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 pretty much all the young guys when I was involved in the academy, um, they're all kind of bubbling yeah. away through, you know. Um, the, you know. The schools do such a great job of, you know, delivering these young lads to. Mm. Um, I mean, I was a mess leaving school. Like I, yeah. I knew it. I went to college and it was bumbling along, but how together they are in their minds around how they need to act as a professional rugby player when they're in here. Yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. And when they come in the door first, you know, there's a few. Um, Wrinkles need to be ironed out, but yeah, they, yeah. They're, they're just, you know, they're, they're an absolute pleasure to work with, you know? Yeah, yeah. So those guys that I mentioned, um, uh, James, Tracy, uh, all, all those guys, um, working with them over the last, you know, what is it now, um, six, seven, eight years, is, it's mad to watch it, you know? It's yeah. crazy to watch it all come through, you know? They're, they're, um, you're in admiration, like, like, I've forgotten that I played rugby. Like, when I watch the game now, I'm like, Jesus, yeah, yeah, fair yeah. play to them. And when I watch them pitch up, get through reviews, you know, and pitch up again next week. Yeah. I'm kind of going, I'm, I'm, I'm in total admiration of, of what they do, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's tough. Yeah. I actually, there's, um, out of all them, I suppose, well, there's, there's so many good players you mentioned there, but uh, I remember just having seen James and, and that brilliant Michaels team that he was part of. And yeah, yeah. It's funny when lads stick out, like, you're like, this guy's going to be one to watch Freak. as well. Like, yeah, did you, you know, is he someone that, like... Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, Andrew Porter, I Andrew Porter. I dropped Andrew Porter when he was 17 or 18. And I still remember, I still have his little face in my, in my mind. And he's turned into another beast and I've yes, seen him come yeah. through. But with, with JR, it hits you real quick. Mm. You're kind of going, Jesus. He's des First of all, physically, he's designed for the game. Yeah, yeah. But then once you get to know him and how he actually processes all his bits, um, how driven he is, mm -hmm. um, scary stuff. Like, like I said, when I left school, I was just like, how much crack can I have? Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean, crack is in fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that's that was my approach. You know, we have some crack here, and you know, different time, obviously, we yeah. drink beers and play a bit of rugby and whatever. But yeah, these, these lads are different, different gravy. Yeah, aren't they? Does um, you were talking about that? Yeah, like the, that the goal maybe when you were starting was, you know, maybe not kind of written down on paper, but Ireland as well. So hmm. how good did it feel? Like how did it? Was it Andy gave you a shout, or was it catch you at a game one day, or like? Uh, just... Davies before would have made contact okay, first. Yeah, yeah. We went and met and met with Andy, and uh, it was, yeah, it was. Again, something that I, f I felt like I'm starting to move towards. So, mm -hmm. you know, so much of that has to do with the group that are here, and I'm conscious of that as well. Like, so, you know, this group going so well gives me an opportunity to start to, to put myself out there as well. So, um, yeah, I guess I was in my mind, I was starting to think this is something I want to move towards. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm working with a, a, a good group of players and felt that I could add value. And, and that's, that's, that's what I was thinking in my mind. And then when you get a phone call, it's, it's, it's mad. Yeah, I yeah. rang my missus straight away and it was like, uh, Nisa Four wants to meet me, you know, about, about, uh, about I, don't know, I don't know what, but I'm, I'm hoping it's about yeah. this job. Yeah. And, uh, Travel tips. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, been a, it's, been a, it's been crazy. Yeah, I haven't probably thought about it an awful lot because this part of the season is so, it fills your mind up so much with what you're doing mm, right now yeah. that every now and again I stop and go, oh my God, I have to, you know, this is all going to finish in two weeks and I need to plan for the next part now. And I probably still haven't gone there fully in my head, but um, in the moments that I do, it's, it's, I'm pretty, pretty chuffed, you know. It's yeah. something that my family is really, really proud of and I'm, I'm, I'm proud of as well, you know, so it's great.
Well, what is it? We'll look, finish then by looking ahead to this Munster game then at the weekend. And uh, yeah, fittingly, it's in the RDS, and it, it's not only for yourself, it's like Sean O'Brien, Jack McGrath. Yeah, no, a good few. Yeah, yeah a few good few other guys are all going to be finishing up then as well. And mm. um, you know, like, what would it kind of mean to you then again, like to kind of you know have, at least have a, a win and send off at the RDS as well? Um, yeah, I, w- I want the team. I want the team to do well. Yeah, like, desperately, desperately, desperately want the team to do well. Um, if they do really well, if we perform really, really well, I'll probably be happy mm-hmm. um, that, that I was part of something. Yeah. Last week, like I said, driving up St. James's Gate into the stadium um, and seeing this, the level of support. Yeah, it was inc- yeah. Like something in the, in the minds of the supporters, the, the lads have created that. Mm. You know, they've given them big moments throughout the season that people decided to come over, you know, 20,000, 25,000 people decided to come over and and be there before, when we're driving into the stadium. That was a huge, yeah. f- for me, that was a big moment. I think when the players play the game, it's, it's them and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm there with them and it's very much, I hope they win, I want them to win. Um, but you're so ingrained in the performance side of things. I want us to perform for the supporters because we've obviously created something in the minds of supporters and I, I'm, I'm proud that I played some part in that over the last number of years. So. Um, Either way, I'm really, really proud of my time in Leinster. Um, I hope we put in a hell of a performance the weekend and, and want to win. We all want to win, so yeah, it's going to be a cracker. I think it's going to be an epic game, you know. Yeah, it should be. Okay, yeah, well, listen. Ho- hopefully, actually, I will say hopefully because I am from Leinster as well. Hopefully, it goes <laughs> well. Okay. Thank you very <laughs> much. Wind the lads up. Yeah, cheers for that.